I'm Howard Wall, and welcome to Free Exchange. Uh, today, our guest is uh, Dr. Robert Higgs, who is at the Independent Institute and the Mises Institute, and he'll be joining us to chat about uh, his work and his thoughts on uh, economic history and uh, current events and how it fits with some of the, the work that he has done in the, in the past. So thank you. Welcome for the, to the show. Thank you, Howard. So I want to start out, your, I guess if we want to call your claim to fame or your big, uh, your, your most famous book would be uh, Crisis and Leviathan, which I see there's a 25th edition that's, that's been out. Uh, can you tell us a bit about the, what's the central thesis of that? Uh, that book uh, was my attempt to um, explain the growth of government over a long period uh, from the late 19th century to the, to the late uh, 20th century. The book was published in 1987, so I, uh, I made an attempt to um, go from a time when I regarded the, the government's involvement in economic life, especially the federal government's involvement in economic life, as, as, as extremely limited and track how it became so much uh, uh, larger and uh, more intrusive uh, over time. And uh, in doing that, I, I decided I needed to focus more than other economists and historians had on the role of, of great crises uh, in that uh, long uh, evolution. Uh, many people wanted to look at it as just a a kind of trend movement, something uh -huh. that had gradually developed over time, and, and of course many aspects of it have that character. Uh, but uh, it seemed to me as an economic historian who'd, who'd uh, at least got a good start on this subject that, that uh, people had failed to give adequate attention to uh, how uh, particularly the two world wars and the Great Depression uh, had played critical roles in uh, not only themselves and the great events that were associated with them, but in the way they, as it were, kept that upward trend alive and even elevated it to higher levels than it would have attained otherwise. So the general subject was the growth of government in, the, in every sense, growth in size, scope, and power, and uh, corresponding to that, of course, uh, was a, a diminution of the scope of individual liberty that had taken place. Uh, one can't decide a given issue in, in two different ways. If the government decides how something will be done, then individuals are not deciding how it will be done. So this growth of government to power uh, was at the expense of individual liberties. Now, when you say something happens in a in a crisis, is it that you know a crisis occurs, so there's some natural government reaction, and then so the government starts doing more, say spending more, and then they maintain that level, so it ratchets up, or is there? Well, more to I, it? I found that that was an aspect of all the great crises, particularly the the two world wars and the uh, and the Great Depression, but. Uh, to some extent of smaller crises as well, uh, say the 10-year period from about 1964 to 74 during the presidencies of uh, Johnson and Nixon uh, had a lot of similarities. It wasn't as focused uh, a crisis as the, the three I've mentioned, uh, but it had many similarities and it had a similar ratcheting uh, connected with it as well because uh, governments uh, did extraordinary things in, in all of these episodes. And then the question is, why, did they, why didn't they revert to the, the status quo anti-crisis after the crisis was over? And a lot of my attention in the book was uh, focused on that question. Uh, what makes new powers and new levels of activity stick? Uh, when the reasons uh, for their initial uh, appearance uh, fade away or disappear completely. Now, do you, did you find that uh, say government knows that crisis might prevent an opportunity and they either, I don't know, if manufacture a crisis or uh, at least paint something as a crisis in order to achieve things? Is well, that... ultimately, government officials learned that, that crisis was a wonderful lever for them. As uh, Rahm Emanuel put it more recently, uh, one doesn't want to let a crisis go to waste. And what he meant there is that uh, uh, politicians and other people uh, who want to work through the government understand uh, 
that in a crisis, some of the barriers that normally impede what they're trying to do are lowered or removed. And so they have a chance then that they wouldn't otherwise have had to implement their plans. And of course, if one has that understanding, there's a temptation to concoct a crisis or to represent some uh, state of affairs as a crisis, even if it isn't, and they know it isn't, because uh, to the extent that they can make people believe a crisis exists, then the same uh, uh, possibilities open up for them. Now, is this referring to the uh, tendency to uh, refer to things as war, war on poverty, uh, that, war, that is you know, connected. I, and I, literal I believe. wars. Uh, uh, William James spoke of the moral equivalent of war uh, back around the right. beginning of the 20th century, and uh, what what he was urging at the time was that uh, that all the great things that government is supposed to have done during wartime uh, should be done in peacetime, that we shouldn't need uh, mass slaughter and uh, mass waste of resources that are associated with actual war making in order to achieve these great public purposes. And so he, he was all in favor of the moral equivalent of war, but uh, many politicians, of course, simply want to feather their nests and their cronies' nest, and so this is simply one of the tools in their toolbox. Well, it's ironic that the, you know, I've heard the story after World War II, you know, government did so such a great job that they should do take on more, but what they did a great job at was killing <laughs> hundreds of or millions of, of people. And I'm not sure that meant them well they were well suited to things that they were doing post war. Well, at least since <laughs> World War I, uh, politicians have made the argument that uh, we did extraordinary things to win the war, we can do similar or the same extraordinary things in peacetime to achieve other purposes. Even uh, President Hoover made that argument in the early 1930s in uh, support of some of his pr uh, programs and actions to alleviate the, the developing depression at that time, and of course, uh, R Roosevelt, when he took office in 1933, was a master of representing conditions as, as emergency conditions, and many of the uh, legislative acts of 1933 and 34 have the word emergency in their titles right. and in their prefaces. So it clearly became a, a standard resort uh, by the 1920s and 30s of all kinds of politicians. Well, and through, through the Great Depression, actually the, it was a series of mini depressions because there were recovery periods mm -hmm. that the country was then thrown into because the government was still responding to a crisis that had abated and cr pushed us into another one is the, yes. the common argument. Uh, the actions the government took all the way from Hoover in the beginning in 1929 to the very end of the 1930s were almost all, if not all, uh, counterproductive uh, with regard to relieving and shortening uh, the depression. And, uh, and yet the government continued to take these actions and uh, worsen things, uh, which would have got better much quicker uh, had the government simply folded its arms and done nothing. Now that's sounding vaguely uh, familiar. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember in 2009 when President Obama took office, I mentioned uh, to people that I thought he, he was going to be the luckiest president because if he does nothing, <laughs> we're going to bounce back so fast from this because it's the Fed had already mm -hmm. done what it needed to do, mm -hmm. and we're going to bounce back because a deep de recession is always results with a fast, strong mm -hmm. recovery, and if President Obama did nothing, we would do great. Mm -hmm. But he went out of his way to do the opposite right. in many ways, and uh, the answer to the failure of those policies to uh, get things going was to do more of them or do them bigger. Yeah, I, is that I, agree, a I, theme? I agree, certainly. <laughs> uh, uh, but that action uh, has parallels earlier uh, all the way from uh, World War I on. Uh, that uh, when government could uh, do a lot of good by doing nothing, uh, 
Uh, that doesn't serve the purpose of people who want to seize government power for their own ends. And very few politicians, at least since the time of Coolidge, uh, have been uh, the sort that wanted to fold their arms. There's a myth about Hoover uh, that, was, uh, that was instigated by his uh, political opponents that he was a do-nothing president who just fiddled while Rome burned, but that's a complete myth. He was nothing of the sort. He, he took a number of extraordinary actions that made the uh, Depression much worse than it would have been if he had done nothing. So all the way from Hoover, at least, to the present, uh, it's been uh, virtually impossible to find a true do-nothing president, right. particularly <laughs> when there's a perceived crisis. Well, and Hoover, in fact, he was an engineer and thought he could engineer the economy, <laughs> much like many economists now yes. think they're engineers right. yes. of, of the economy. Yeah. Hoover was a very accomplished man uh, in many ways. He had had a wonderful business career. He was, he was a highly intelligent man. He was well informed. But unfortunately, he fooled himself in thinking that he understood how the economy worked and how he could intervene in it productively. And in those regards, he was completely misled and uh, the victim of his own hubris. Sure. Now, at, at, now he's, of course, his, his, his name is affixed to the Hoover Institution, which yes. is one of the, uh, I guess, as free market as a university center can be, other than the Hammond Institute, I should say. Uh, now, any other parallels you see in the present? Uh, now, I, I worked at the Fed, and I, I witnessed uh, during the crisis, and I witnessed some of this exactly, and some of it was actually quite innocent, where uh, they, were, they needed emergency powers because markets were collapsing, so they wanted, you know, they were earnest, saying, we'll do this right. and fix it. And TARP was meant to be a uh, one-time thing just to, yeah. and then the Fed was just completely rolled by the politicians all the earnestness was captured yeah, by right. Treasury or vice versa I think in some ways the Fed rolled the politicians while the politicians were rolling the Fed uh, the uh, the Fed was very eager in 2008 to to, to seize a power that it had never exercised before and so a number of the actions taken in the, in the late part of 2008 were unprecedented, even for the Fed. Some of them had, had precedents, uh, but others, particularly the engagement in, in targeted lending and, and bailouts aimed at specific financial uh, sectors or even at specific firms, which were essentially taken over by the Fed, as Fannie and Freddie and AIG were, uh, that had never been done in the past. Uh, mm. Monetary policy had always been a kind of general power aimed to work its way through financial markets in general. Uh, but uh, since 2008, the Fed has occupied itself to an extraordinary degree in what used to be called industrial policy. And well, deciding and we'll, who will we'll take a break float and, and who will sink. And I definitely want to get more, <laughs> talk more about, about the Fed. And uh, we'll be, this is Free Exchange, and we'll be back in, in a minute. They said I couldn't dream. Called me a piece of trash and swore that's all I'd ever be. Said a bottle couldn't see the ocean. Give up. Go back to the dumpster. But I didn't listen. I made my way. And now, I am what I've always wanted to be. Welcome back to Free Exchange. I'm Howard Wall, the director of the Hammond Institute, and we're talking to Robert Higgs about uh, crisis and government expansion. And last time, we, before the break, we were talking about uh, the crisis and the, uh, and the Fed's role in the financial mm -hmm. crisis and its, its actions. Now, um, part of the financial crisis, well, most people seem to think that the financial crisis was a failure of the, uh, the market system. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you know, government needed to step in and fix it, and now 
of course, go and um, rearrange, you know, make sure that the private sector didn't run wild like that again. Do you have any views on that common theme? I, I, I do indeed. <laughs> uh, this is a remarkable interpretation and I think flies uh, entirely in the face of the facts of how the crisis developed in the first place. The Fed was uh, feeding the, the real estate boom and the and the boom in, in rotten mortgages all the way from 2003 on for a period of about four years. And, and it was that creation of the housing bubble and the, the backing that was available from the, the credit created through the banking system with Fed accommodation that allowed that that bubble to take place and, and to find its outlet primarily in real estate and, and real estate related securities and, and to some extent in the stock market as well. Uh, and people were fooled, including I think some of the Fed managers fooled because consumer price index was not uh, increasing very rapidly and, and that tends to be the, the focus that they uh, examine when they're asking, are we, are we uh, creating too much credit, too little credit? But that is a very mistaken way to think about the effects of what they do, uh, because uh, when uh, credit is cheap, uh, it can flow anywhere. It can flow into asset markets as well as into markets for currently produced goods and services. And, and in these bubble situations, which uh, in some ways resembled what had happened in the 1920s, when the Fed made credit easy, the price level was stable for final goods and services, and yet real estate bubbles arose and stock market bubble arose and uh, with very bad consequences when, uh, when credit was, was tightened up uh, after 1928 uh, in the earlier episode and after uh, about 2006 in the more recent one. So, we all know that uh, the, the big danger of Fed policy is that it, it, it has lags in it. it, and as a result, it takes the wrong action because it's reacting to something that's already done uh, or not reacting to something that it has already done. Well, people forget that the Fed was uh, fairly aggressively raising rates uh, after keeping them very, very low yes. from, from the end of the recession earlier in the decade, mm -hmm. and that that was right before the uh, bubble burst, and also oil prices were shooting up around the same time. Mm -hmm. So the Fed was not, they were suddenly not accommodative. Right. After they had kind of let the genie out of the bottle, they went yes. and tried to right. hammer the genie in the head, yeah. and the genie turned around and Well, if there's back a, one them. thing I think a lot of economists agree it, uh, on, it's the importance of, of stable monetary policy. And uh, in order to do that, the Fed really has to, to stop trying to manage the business cycle. Uh, in the process of trying to manage the business cycle, the Fed has probably made more volatility than would have existed if it did nothing, concentrated on stable growth of the money stock or something that was more doable and more within the scope of what the Fed knows how to do. Uh, and this just seems to be a lesson that the Fed refuses to learn. Uh, it's not clear why. In the, in the recent case, clearly Bernanke was much influenced by his understanding of the Great Depression right. and his belief that, that had the Fed been, been more vigorous in the early 1930s, it could have uh, created enough credit to, to limit the damage done in, in between 1929 and 1933. Uh, I, I myself have many misgivings about Bernanke's understanding of what happened in the well, Depression. Well, his understanding comes from that the Fed did the opposite of that. Yes. So, but the conclusion is not that you then do That's the other right. extreme. That's there's right. There's the middle ground of do And there's also the nothing. fact that monetary policy, despite what many people think, is not the one tail that wags the whole economic dog. Lots of other things can happen when a recession gets underway, regardless of what triggers it, that make it worse or better. And those things have to be taken into account. They're not all simply at the command of monetary decision makers.
Well, so you said that the, the Fed should uh, stick to what it knows best. Uh, what does the Fed know best? Because part of the problem yes. is uh, with many, many economists is that they do think that they are engineers yes. and that they, they know a lot more. They, they think they know a lot more about how the economy works than they really do. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think economists, macroeconomists need a lot more humility and to realize what it is they don't know. But they're always very confident, it mm -hmm. seems to me, mm -hmm. that they know, and they're very confident right now that they can pull the money back if, right. if necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, so do you see part of the economic profession is part of the problem here? Definitely. <laughs> uh, one of the, th the striking things about the current crisis was how many macroeconomists seem to be struck dumb by its very occurrence. It wasn't part of their models. The standard macro models, of course, don't even have financial sectors. Right. So <laughs> they had no idea why a financial debacle had brought about a recession. Uh, and, and it was almost humorous to see uh, how unrelated their ways of thinking were to reality. So yes, the economics profession, the mainstream profession, is very much to, to be blamed for misunderstanding how the economy works. Now, uh, if I had my druthers, uh, I would simply abolish the Fed and let the production uh, of money return to the, to the free market, where it ought to be and where it would work better. But if we're going to have a Fed, uh, I think Fed officials can find out how to manage the, the long-term stability of monetary growth much better than they can find out how to manage the ups and downs of business fluctuations. Now, there was a time at the Fed, this is, was an ongoing joke when I worked at the Fed, was that uh, maybe 20 years ago, a majority of Fed economists agreed yes. that the Fed should be abolished. Yes. But I don't think that's, that's true anymore. No, I think they've had a turnaround. And, and I think to some extent recently they've, they've told themselves a story about saving the world that has made them very happy with how they reacted in 2008 and since, uh, despite these extraordinary actions. And uh, what I believe is that they have not saved the world, that they didn't save the world at the time. Indeed, the world was in no need of salvation in 2008. It probably would have been better in the long term had the Fed not undertaken any of those extraordinary actions uh, uh, at that time. But at all events, what they've done now is to create this extraordinary amount of bank reserves uh, taking excess reserves in the banking system from virtually zero uh, up to the neighborhood of two trillion dollars. And as you know, if you'd told that story to somebody 10 years ago, <laughs> they would have thought you were crazy. That was a probability zero that the Fed would ever do that. And yet that's what it has done. And now it finds itself in this position of needing an exit and really not knowing how to do it without wrecking the economy all over again. Uh, Bernanke made very confident statements before he left the chairmanship about having a plan for exit. But when I read his plan, it doesn't persuade me that it will work or that it even can be carried through as he says it can be. I hope I'm wrong about that, because if I'm right about it, then we have real troubles ahead of us in trying to get out of the situation the Fed has put us in. Well, I remember when the, uh, in probably 2009, if you're familiar with The Onion, which is yes. a satirical yes. magazine, they had a headline, uh, uh, you know, the econ U.S. economy waits for the next bubble to get us out of this crisis. <laughs> and everyone laughed. That was funny. But now we have a stock market. The stock market has really yes. taken off, right. which looks uh, suspicious. And if you talk to people on Wall Street, they attribute it entirely to getting free money from the Fed that, and firms just pour it into dividends, raise right. stock prices, and that right. perhaps we have just created this new bubble to... Uh, well, I, I think that's a real possibility. Uh, but we need to remember that uh, you know, back in 2001, there were very prominent economists begging the Fed for a new bubble, one of whom uh, writes for the New York Times. And actually using that language, what we need is now that the tech bubble is burst is a real estate bubble. And 
Well, he got his wish, <laughs> yes. that's for sure, and he's not one bit apologetic today about making that statement. But, but no, it, if you ask him, he would probably say the bubble wasn't big enough. <laughs> I'm sure he would. <laughs> but uh, now we have this, uh, this stock market that may very well be uh, waiting for another fall, uh, and a big one. Uh, and we've had big run-ups in a lot of commodity prices in the last few years as well. But at the same time that people have been pouring uh, this, this, this easy money in, into these particular asset markets, uh, firms have been very reluctant to make long-term private investments, uh, even though many big firms are sitting on mountains of cash. And uh, that's a very bad combination because uh, what an economy needs for real growth uh, in the long term is an ongoing high level of long-term private investment. The places where we get new capital stock, we get to implement new technologies, and uh, the revival of private investment, even now, is not back to where it was bef before the economy turned down in 2008. So this is, this is a, a bad conjunction in my view, and, and it's one that I think does relate to how the Fed has tried to manage the economy uh, since two, 2008. So that there's a new, um, a new excuse that's come up that I know that uh, Larry Summers and some people at the Fed have said is that actually all of the things we've done since 2009 have worked. <laughs> It's that the economy is supposed to be this crappy. There was some structural change <laughs> that occurred, so we, it's actually great. This is as good as it can be. Yeah. Uh, uh, that's, a, that's a lame uh, excuse, it's uh, right. and it's one actually the historian is very familiar with. There's always a new era. It's always right. different this time. But after some time passes and the historian looks back, it was never different. It was always the same in these essential respects. Uh, Economists are not known for their good judgment about long-term <laughs> events, and they're much too sensitive to uh, the, the need they see to react to short-term uh, events. And uh, the good economist uh, thinks about not just what will happen if you do X, but what will happen then, and then, right. and then, <laughs> far down the road. And uh, if one were so presumptuous as to try to improve on uh, the private economy's operation, uh, the best one could do would be to think in terms of what is good for its long-term improvement, not what is good for making it better next month or this year. Because you'll get neither. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, any, uh, any closing comments? Well, I about think the future? Any we, hope? we live in interesting <laughs> times, as they say, and uh, these are not all good times. Uh, uh, we've never been in the situation we're in now. Uh, in that sense, this is a different uh, situation uh, so far, <clears throat> as far as monetary policy is concerned. Uh, we have this uh, mountain, gigantic mountain of bank reserves sitting in the banks, or actually on deposit at the Fed, <clears throat> and why it's sitting there is, to my way of thinking, still something of a mystery. Uh, we can see that there's a lot of uncertainty now about future policy making, about future monetary policy, uh, but nonetheless, for banks to hold that volume of reserves earning a negative real rate of return because the Fed's only paying them a quarter of 1% nominal return, which means they're losing real value on all those reserves they hold all the time. That tells me that, that, that we're in a situation where either the banks are scared to death, perhaps because they know about their balance sheets better than the public, or the borrowing sector of the economy is scared to death, uh, or in some cases, as I said, the big firms simply don't need to borrow because they have so much cash on hand themselves. Right. Uh, but certainly the smaller firms that might want to borrow uh, still, I think, harbor a lot of fears related to things like how Obamacare is going to affect their costs, uh, what's going to happen to a variety of regulatory measures, what's going to happen to tax policy. So I think we are in a situation right now that is affected by what I call regime uncertainty. 
And until that's clarified some, I think things are not going to get much better. Well, I think the possibility is that they're all scared to death. And we'll leave on that very <laughs> <laughs> depressing note. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to thank our guest, Robert Higgs, for joining us. This has been Free Exchange. Thank you.